Well, morning glory and hallelujah. Grace and peace be with you. It's Palm Sunday, and I'm Pastor Jesse. Today we're going to continue our sermon series on fellowship. We began looking at the church that was planted on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.42. If you recall, the Bible says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Acts 2.42. So a few weeks ago, we discussed that fellowship we are discussing is the kind that loves someone through the hurt. In other words, it is the friendship that you have with someone after you have forgiven and reconciled with them. I provided two ideas to guide us regarding fellowship. Fellowship is a deepening friendship. And fellowship has a common vision. The common vision that this early church had was the apostles' teaching. We discussed that this is the New Testament's interpretation of the Old Testament. In other words, it is the words and commands of Jesus. The heart of this teaching is the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, that's Jesus, and of the, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has said. That's a lot, yeah? Can't we just, can't we just be nice to people? Well, I mean, Jesus said more than that. Amen? Amen. So last week we went deeper into Jesus' teaching as to what the first two greatest commandments are. We're to love the Lord with all of our hearts, with all of our, all of our soul, right? We can do the, the heart, all of our soul, point to the bottom of your foot, right? And all of your mind and strength, right? Everything, all of your influence, and the second is to love your neighbor, and we clarified that's the person next to you, as yourself. Later on, that would get, uh, we'd get, be given a new commandment. It's actually the night before Passover that seems to happen. The new commandment is to love one another as Jesus has loved you. And Jesus was willing to die for you. Amen. That's serious. That's a lot. So... This week, I'd like to continue to discuss fellowship and what it is to break bread together with prayer. Jesus has given us a way to have unity and fellowship with himself and one another. And here are the passages from Acts 2 once again. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Oh, wait, I got a picture up there. Hey, do you see that little guy in the back there? That's little David Josiah, little Psy guy. And that's the back of Gracie's head, and that's a good friend of mine and his son there next to him. He has visited here before, but they don't, they're not local. 242. They start so small. They get big so fast. They voted, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. And later in that same passage in verses 46 through 47, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What does it mean for the Acts 2 community to break bread together? Well, quite simply, I believe it means that they were taking communion together. I would like to think that the church community that formed as a result of the Holy Spirit being poured out on the believers during Pentecost had some foundational wisdom concerning how we are to function. They had friendship that makes fellowship. They had common vision outlined in the apostles' teaching about Jesus. And they had a way that Jesus instructed for his followers to have fellowship with Jesus in the sacrament of communion, found in Acts 2.42. In Acts 2.46, we continue to read that the followers of Jesus would meet in the temple, temple courts, and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. 
Does this mean that every time the believers came together at someone's house, they had to have communion? I don't think so. Breaking bread is a term that just means eating together, but in the context of Acts 2.42, it leads me to believe that this breaking of bread was something more ceremonial. If they were the same thing, breaking bread and just eating together, then why would they be repeated in the text? What we have here are two different ideas. One is that the early church did practice communion along with prayer, and the other is that the early church demonstrated their fellowship in small groups. And I think that small groups are a fantastic way, by the way, to go. It, it's in smaller groups that the general assembly, than the general assembly that we have on Sunday morning. So this is a larger group that we have meet together here. But in small groups, you can really share life together. It should be a place where everybody feels welcome. I'm tempted to sing a theme song for, uh, for an older show, but it, it, you know, I wouldn't want to talk about a bar in front of the church. So You want to go where everyone knows your name, right? Something like that. It, sh it should be a place where everyone feels welcomed and loved as a brother or sister in Christ. Small groups give us a more intimate um, a uh, group of people who follow Jesus uh, to confess our real life struggles too. It should be a group of people who are not looking to gossip, but instead pray for one another. And we all need a small group like this to lift us up and take care of us when life gets tough. <coughs> one of the first administrative assignments that I had in a church was to launch small groups in a church of about 300 people. I learned a lot during this time. I was working with people who loved the idea of sharing the gift of hospitality. They would open up their homes to groups of five to 12 people, and they usually would share a dessert. Cake is bread, is it not? That's my idea of breaking bread together in homes. I, I like cake. And ever since the movie Jumanji came out, my kids always remind me that cake makes them explode. So. <laughs> That's a line from the movie. So there's some of the, the people who I would have considered a small group when I lived in Jerusalem. So you can see there people from all over the world. We have people there from Germany as well as uh, South Korea. And uh, we all just came together and loved one another. Um, my Gracie, I think, learned Twinkle Twinkle Little Star from uh, the Korean woman there in the middle with a Korean accent. So the first time she learned Twinkle Twinkle Little Star at Korean accent. In fact, in Jerusalem, I had so many people from uh, Korea in my, uh, my uh, they, they call it a modern, it's modern Hebrew, it's upan, okay, um, that I thought I was going to learn modern Hebrew with a Korean accent, just because there were so many of them. But Sometimes the person who opened their, their study, whether it was in their home or it was here at the church for a Bible study, they didn't make dessert. I know, I know. Some of the groups that I was working with would take turns making dessert. In other words, one couple would make it on the first week of the month, and then a different couple would buy dessert on the second week of the month because, like me, they did not cook well. And I don't cook at all, by the way. I mean, I, my joke has always been that I could burn ice in the microwave. I mean, I'm really bad. I mean, I can make a mean bowl of Cheerios. I mean, if that's what, if that's what you call cooking, but... Uh, I might try to burn some hot dogs one day, but anyways, I'm bad. I mean, really bad. Uh, my wife takes good care of me. I, I actually once bent a metal knife trying to get shortbread out of a pan that I had made. So uh, anyways, enough about my shortcomings. The point is that everyone shared responsibilities and that everyone had fun. Hey, Gracie, you're not supposed to do that. It's supposed to like just crumble, you know, so... I, I did it with your mother, with Melinda, and uh, she didn't know what went wrong. It always goes right when she does it, so whatever. All right. But some of the groups had a teacher, and some of the other groups, uh, they needed one. So I would bring in a teacher. So the people who hosted the evening did not always have to teach, and they did not always have to bake necessarily. Sometimes it's a good thing if they don't. We have uh, several small groups that meet here on our campus. We have a men's fellowship. 
uh, that has breakfast together on the second Saturday of the month. And we have a men's study usually on the first Saturday. Are we having a men's study this coming Saturday? <laughs> we are? So we, we have one on, uh, on Holy Saturday, right? The day that Jesus rests in the tomb. We also have a women's Bible study that we're looking to get up and going again in a few weeks on Wednesdays at 2. It'll be after spring break. Another small group is God Talk. Now, God Talk is where we pray to God or talk to God about each other's praises and requests, and then we listen to God by reading His Word. We, we have some really fun and interesting discussions at God Talk, and that's Thursdays in the evening at 6.15 p.m. So that's the study I do. It, I would call it a discipleship meeting. We also have another group at 9.30 a.m. every Sunday with Jim White. He's got the kids in the other building, but he would tell you that's when church starts, right? 9.30. Uh, our service in here starts at 10.30, but who cares about that, right? You want to get here at 10.15 so you can get the coffee and the, the tea and what else do we have? With cider, all that kind of stuff. But our adult Sunday school happens at 9.30 in our fellowship hall on Sundays. And it's a great way to begin your Sunday to prepare to come into this sanctuary. And it usually meets for about 30 to 45 minutes. So if you wanted to get involved with the group, but you didn't, you didn't want to stay too long, that's a, that's a good one. So that's in the fellowship hall. We have small groups that are focused on kids, too. There's a children's Sunday school at, uh, at 9.30 with Cheryl over there in the fellowship hall. We also have another meeting called Kids Bible Club on Tuesday from 6 to 8 p.m. We sing silly songs. We watch a really cool 20-minute uh, a movie where kids actually go into the Bible and they interact with characters like Moses and Jesus. Uh, uh, we do crafts there. We do games. And then, of course, we bring out our great big giant bounce houses uh, that are in the shape of slides and obstacle courses. And this is for kids. Kids who are age uh, 4 to 12. So one last small group that we have going on at the Nazarene Church is our youth group. Youth group is for 6th graders to 12th graders. Uh, we worship God through song. We, we eat together. We work through a chapter in Luke right now together. Uh, and then we get out our Nerf guns and we get really silly. Sometimes they get on those giant inflatables and shoot each other flying through the air. It's, uh, it's really good. Please don't tell our insurance agent. But it's fun. We also do trips like going to see Toby Mac. We're going to a big youth rally in San Diego called Elevate Soon. Uh, we play at Haas Farm. We did that in the fall. Uh, and some of us even went down to Fullerton, California, to work at the Operation Christmas Child Warehouse. We may have also stopped off at uh, Medieval Times and Universal Studios while we are there. But the bottom line is we have fellowship together. And we celebrate Jesus and the life that he has given us together. Small groups are a really great place to, to get to know people. And I would suggest to you that it is really good to meet with a bunch of Jesus followers during the week in addition to being here on Sunday. Some people have told me once a week is just not enough. And so this is another way that you can join in. We've tried to have men's groups and women's groups, kids groups, uh, groups in the middle of the day, groups in the evening. We've tried to, to stagger things so that there's a time that you're available to, to come uh, if that's something you want to do. Let's see here. Uh, you can see the early church did this too. And it it really isn't a new idea. In the picture up there on the screen, you can see my good friends Ellie and Keshet. Uh, Ellie is a very masculine name. In English, we would say Eli. Um, and Keshet is the Hebrew word for bow, like rainbow. But uh, I, I respectfully call these two my, uh, my Jewish big brother and sister. Ellie's family has been in Israel for 500 years, at least. And um, when I was sent to Jerusalem, I showed up at church one day, and uh, it was very clear from the, the, a couple 70-year-old people running to me saying, there are Jews here from Jerusalem, and you need to talk to them. And they almost expected me to stop the whole service so I could go talk to Ellie. But I talked to him afterwards, and they were staying at a very good friend of mine's house, wouldn't you know it. And I came over, and this, these are the people that God used for me to connect with on the other side of the world when I went to live there for three years. So very special people to us.
Small groups are a great place to learn because you can ask questions during the teaching. Normally, I'm interested to know if anyone would like to attend small groups and it is not, who's not currently attending one. If, if you are, and you just could write your name down, you can tear off a piece of your bulletin or something and a phone number if you want a little bit of help, and you could just leave it on one of the prayer altars at the end of the service. I'll get that and uh, I'll give you a call and see if I can help you find a group. But my hope is that our church office uh, and myself can connect you. That's, that's the main thing. An opportunity that you have to participate in loving others this week is at our monthly soup kitchen. That is meeting this Wednesday. It's at the Douglas City Fire Hall from 11 to 1. And to participate there, all you have to do is come down and get a free meal and be nice. Be nice. That's important. There are clothes there for people if it can help them, but it's a great place to just be kind and, and get a restaurant quality meal. Beef stew, I think, is what is up. You do not have to be in need to join in. I'm usually there in attendance, and I am always leave with a full belly. It's a good day. I remember when Melinda and I had our, our first child, Gracie, who's uh, just a few months away from being 17, we were so blessed by our small group. I usually did the teaching, but when it came to baby stuff, there were some experienced moms and dad who had much to teach me. They were just wonderful. Uh, they helped me with some of my fears about bringing a child into the world. I just knew I was going to break her somehow, you know. Uh, much less they, they shared with me what I needed to do to get Melinda to the right hospital in time. And I was living in uh, Calaveras County when... Uh, when Gracie was born and, and we needed to drive to the next county to do that. So they loved us in other ways too. They helped us with meals during that time and, uh, you know, and were available if Melinda needed someone right then and there while I was at work. Our small group was an extension of our family. There's no question. And that's how I feel about our church family. I feel like we're all family and that we can all call each other up and help each other. Many, uh, many of them I can dial on the phone even right now because they're the kind of people you just don't let go of. No matter where in the world God may send you, they're, they, they're close. Just a few weeks ago, I was chatting with a wonderful uh, German family who are really good friends to Melinda and I when I was in, uh, living in Jerusalem. So, so were they. And uh, they had a daughter the same age as us, and we just, we just connected. As I said earlier, small groups are places where you can be prayed for too. As Paul writes in Galatians 6.2, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Yeah. Carrying each other's burdens in prayer is a wonderful blessing to all involved and you can see in Acts 2.42 in the Acts 2 community, they also devoted themselves to prayer. Prayer is just talking to God. It is a good way to have fellowship with people in your small group as well as fellowship with God himself. Now, I don't know if you have any trouble relating to some of the Old Testament passages about sacrificing. I would think that you do because it's not really in practice anymore. There are some strange behaviors that happen this time of year among some Orthodox Jews, usually the, the ultra-religious who, uh, who don't believe in Jesus with chickens. They seem to want to do something to sacrifice chickens. But without their temple, they don't really have the real estate where that's supposed to happen at this point. So you might ask why it stopped. It, the problem for the Jews who do not believe in Jesus, that Jesus is God and King is that they do not have possession of their temple to make their sacrifices in. I've been in the Temple uh, Institute over there, and they have everything, including an altar on wheels, ready to just put in place. But at this point, the, uh, the, the Waqif, which is, I believe, out of Jordan, is still managing the Temple Mount. You might think that this is a barbaric ritual sacrifice. In reality, it's like going to a steakhouse. You would smell barbecue all over the city in Jerusalem. It would smell very good. The sacrificial system was a way for the sons and daughters of Israel to cover their sins. We don't have this problem because of Jesus' death on the cross. That was the sacrifice that paid for all of our sins and for all time. And of course, we celebrate that on Good Friday. Isn't that funny? It's such an important time. Christianity, I believe, is the only religion who says it's not about you, it's about Jesus. It's about somebody else other than you. And we celebrate the fact that our hero, our God and our King, 
dies. And that's confusing. But the good news is he gets up again, yes? He doesn't stay there. And he says, I can do that for you. That's why it's such a good day. Good Friday is the day that your sins were paid for. Without Good Friday, you, you, would, you would be eternally separated from God. That was the price that God had to reconcile those of us that had walked away from him to himself. We are forgiven where those that do not trust in Jesus' sacrifice are hurting for cleansing. When Solomon's temple was destroyed, one of the sacrifices that could still be made was in prayer. And I think of King David's prayer, Solomon's father in Psalm 141. David wrote, O Lord, I call to you. Come quickly to me. Hear my voice when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Incense and the evening sacrifice both had pleasant smells that would ascend to God in heaven. And that's the picture that they lived with. Today when we talk about the altars we're talking about, behind me we have some wooden prayer altars on either side of me. What do we sacrifice on them? <laughs> we sacrifice prayer. And during our worship or after service, if you want a symbolic place to reach up to heaven, that is what these altars are for. And I, every so often, we have people come during the week and they want to accept Christ. And this is that place that we take them, is this prayer altar before the cross here. You can do it anywhere. It's just a symbolic place that is very special to come and meet with God. You see, we practice the four items that are listed in Acts 2.42, just as they did 2,000 years ago. We devote ourselves to fellowship, the apostles' teaching, right, and the study of the word, the breaking of bread, communion, and to prayer. It is a way that we have fellowship with them, and most of all, it is a way that we can have fellowship with God. Uh, if somebody would let uh, Jim know that we're preparing for communion, that would be great. Maybe you could send a text or something like that in the other building. In a few moments, we're going to break bread. And what I mean is we're going to share communion together. I have explained what Jesus meant when he said that this cup is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood, in Jesus' blood. I explained that it was recorded in Jeremiah that God would make a new covenant. And in that context, God said, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Do you like that? Remember your sins no more. You see, you're completely cleansed. God doesn't see anything that you've done wrong at this point. It's that spiritual shower. Eli, you taught me that so long ago. Communion, where you cleanse yourself. No. Jesus cleanses you. Amen? But in truth, it's something that he has us doing together. We come to him, and he finishes what we could not do. So today I want to explain a little bit about what is meant by this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in most churches, they have a table that says this very thing, alluding to communion. It's the place where we go as a memorial to remember that Jesus died for you and for your sins. And he got up. And that's why you can get up too. Amen? So... In the first seven chapters of Leviticus, and you guys all say, I love Leviticus, right? In the first seven chapters of Leviticus, we have the priestly manual regarding sacrifices. The general idea is that the inheritance that the priests will get is not in the land like the other tribes, but God himself will be their inheritance. So how do the priests eat? They are given a portion of the sacrifices that are brought to God because they don't have land to farm or, or to ranch on, if you will. In Leviticus 6, 14 through 18, we read about the rules for the grain offering, you know, like bread. And it reads, these are the regulations for the grain offering. Aaron's sons, so that'd be Moses' brother Aaron, the high priest. Aaron's sons are to bring it before the Lord in front of the altar. The priest is to take a handful of fine 
flour and oil together with incense on the grain offering and burn the memorial portion of the altar as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. So it's going to smell good. Aaron and his sons shall eat the rest of it, but it is to be eaten without yeast. Remember, yeast is symbolic for sin in a holy place. They are to eat it in the courtyard of the tent of the meeting. It must not be baked with yeast. I have given it as their share of the offerings made to me by fire. Like the sin offering and the guilt offering, it is most holy. Have you ever thought why it is important that the priest would eat part of the sacrifice? You might say it's just how they eat, but it's more. They have a very sacred duty. They had to follow all the rules that were given just so, so that the sacrifice would be valid. When a priest is willing to eat the sacrifice, the sacrifice becomes part of him. Just like anything else that you eat becomes part of you. Just like the food that we eat becomes part of us. However, they're eating a portion of the sacrifice is like giving their, their seal of approval. Or I have a seal ring where you'd, you know, it's like a signature. It's a seal of approval that the sacrifice is good. That it has satisfied the requirements necessary. So when Jesus says, this is my body, which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me, he's asking us to act as priests. That is, God's agents before man. He's comparing his body to a grain sacrifice and asking you to give your seal of approval. By eating this sacrifice, you are agreeing that the requirements have been met. That the sinless Jesus... Right? The bread of life. The sinless Jesus is without blemish or defect. And he can remove your sin from you. When you eat the bread, the sacrifice becomes a part of you. And this ceremony is symbolic of your trusting Jesus that he has paid for all of your sins and you are now free from that sin. I don't know about you, but I can't be free of disobedience without asking Jesus to help me. So Jesus paid for all of our sins for all time on the cross and he did that the very next day. The author to the Hebrews says it this way in chapter 10 verses 11 through 18. Day after day the priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Right? He covered it but it couldn't take away sins. But when this priest, let's call him Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins. Did you hear that? All time one sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Is that you? Are you being made holy? The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Can God forget if he wants to? Does that make sense? If he wants to. He says he will remember it no more. So stop bringing up your sin to God. Unless you keep tripping. Then just say a prayer. God, would you help me to, to stop this? I want to I want make you proud, Dad. Just ask him for help. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sins. You see, one sacrifice was done for all time. All your sins have been paid for. You just have to give them to him. And give them up. Paul explains and warns about uh, examining ourselves for the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. This is a serious thing, a respectful thing. So we're commanded in 28, examine yourselves. And only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 
Now we have the kids in here, and I'm really keen on kids being able to take communion. But kids, if you won't take this seriously, if you won't take this respectfully, if you won't examine yourselves and pray, don't take communion. It's a really serious thing. And it's the kind of thing that God will hold you accountable for. So examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. Right? The idea is to confess before you get there so there's nothing left for God to have to discipline you with. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. For this reason, many, I think we did this. Yes. Can we go to the next slide, please? <coughs> Before you participate in the Lord's Supper, be sure that you have asked God to forgive you for all of your sins. You just bow your head and, and pray to God, forgive me. I don't want to do them anymore. I want to follow you, God. You should look at your spouse if he or she is here. Why is it that the pastor's spouse always seems to be missing when he does this? Now, make sure it's all well between you. We should have nothing. We should have no sin keeping us from following the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the words of James 5.16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And if we look at Leviticus 5.5 5 in the context of sacrifice, we read when anyone is guilty in any of these ways, he must confess in what way he has sinned. Consistent teaching, Old Testament to New Testament. The sacrifice did not replace confession or trying to put things right. We want to confess and be right before the Lord before we come to the communion table. Now that we've had unity and fellowship with Jesus and one another, the common vision is pretty clear, yes? Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine. Do you want to follow him? Do you want to repent and believe? Deepening a friendship. We, you see, we're all living life in the same direction. So we're to help each other. We're to love each other. We're not to uh, do one thing on Sunday and Monday is a whole different story. That's not, that's not us. That's not who we are. I want to share you, with you what Peter clarifies for all of us about Christ's sacrifice. So this is First Peter Chapter 1, 18 through 23. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, raised, that God raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, born spiritually, born from above, not of perishable or dying seed, but of imperishable, something that cannot die, something not mortal, through the living and enduring word of God. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, we, we, I'm, just, I'm just enamored by all the things that you've done. The prophecies that, that you gave to a people who did the best they could to follow something they really didn't understand. And then to have you come fulfill these things and to be alive now where we can look back and we can see the prophecy given and the prophecy fulfilled. To give us the confidence 
of the future that is full of hope, that you can be trusted, and the fact that you even want us as a people. We're so blessed. God, would you, would you just fill us with yourself this whole week, this holy week, as we, as we leave these doors? May we bring you with us. Would you just indwell us as the temple of God? And may we invite many people to Resurrection Sunday and speak of what no one has done except you. Beaten death. Come to life after death. And what's more, I don't know if the world seems to understand. It's not just that you did it. It's that you say that you're going to do this for us too. You've given us reason to trust in you and we love you. May we give the world reason to trust you as we invite them to come celebrate with us you and what you've done. The author of life, the creator of this world, the sustainer of this world and the one who loves us. We love you. In your very precious name, in the name of Jesus, amen.